thank you, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak. Let me see if I can work out the... Uh, So <coughs> I want to talk about the relationship between uh, Galois representations and modular forms. So let me start kind of at the beginning with the, the definition of uh, the modular forms. So this is a kind of function theoretic object. So we look at the complex upper half, uh, upper half plane. complex numbers with positive imaginary part, and on this we have the action of the group SL2C, where uh, oops, the matrix just acts by Mobius transformations, so Z plus B on C, Z plus D. And, <coughs> well, we want to consider functions, holomorphic functions, which are invariant by this group, or by an arithmetic subgroup, so if we don't want to consider the, the uh, whole group, we can consider just matrices which are congruent to uh, upper triangular unipot and modulo n. So here n will be a positive integer. <coughs> and um, And then, <coughs> well, we, so we want to consider functions which are almost invariant by the action of this group. So we consider um, so this, this the space of holomorphic functions uh, f in the upper half plane to C. Um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, such that you have two conditions. One is the automorphic condition, so this says the function is not quite invariant, but <coughs> uh, it transforms and with an automorphic factor, so gamma is, uh, gamma is ABCD, and uh, a will be an integer greater or equal to 1. <coughs> and then there's a second condition. And to explain the second condition, I can ap I apply the first condition with gamma equal, also I should say gamma is in gamma 1 of n. Um, <coughs> I apply the first condition with gamma upper triangular, this upper triangular unipotent matrix. And then the first condition just says that f is an variant by translation by 1. So then this automorphic factor <coughs> is, uh, this automorphic factor is just 1 in that case. And so <coughs> then by Fourier theory, f has, so this implies that f has an expansion. Q here is e to the 2 pi i z, so you can see this is a function which is an, has this translation property, and <coughs> so you can build the others out of it. So that's not a condition yet, that's just a remark. And then uh, we require, so this is the condition too, so we require that uh, a n is 0, n less than or equal to 0. And in fact, if n is equal to 1, so if we're working with the whole group SL2Z, then this is the condition. And otherwise, uh, <coughs> there are some other conditions, but they have a kind of similar, uh, they have a similar flavor. So you pull back f by a function, which is not actually in uh, gamma, in, in this group gamma 1 of n. And then you kind of take, an, there's an expansion like this, <coughs> and you, uh, you require a similar condition. So. In general, there are some other conditions, but they're of a similar nature. So I'll just leave that there. Um, 
So that's a, that's the definition. And <coughs> uh, so here are the here are some basic basic facts about the space. So one fact, which is fundamental, which we'll use later on, is that the space is finite dimensional. Um, <coughs> and the second thing is that there's a uh, there's a collection of commuting operators on the space called Hecker operators. And I'm just going to talk about the ones <coughs> for uh, call it M, M co-prime to, to this integer big N, which is called the level. So these, are, these commute. And I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to tell you exactly the definition, but <coughs> um, there's a kind of simple description of uh, what these operators are do in, in terms of uh, in terms of the Fourier co in terms of these Fourier coefficients. Um, so let me just say that uh, if you have a if you have a function in the space, so non-zero function, which is an eigenform. these operators, <coughs> um, so first, I mean, I should remark that, well, let me kind of finish the sentence. So if I have such a function uh, and I take it, I look at its Fourier expansion, so now only the Fourier coefficients with uh, positive indices appear, and <coughs> I mean, it's kind of harmless to assume that uh, in fact, that a one is is one. So, <coughs> uh, well, I'll say I mean a word about this in a second. So, if we assume this, then in fact the uh, the eigenvalues of these operators are just given by the co the Fourier coefficients. So, this is a kind of harmless assumption because if uh, <clears throat> if I have a, a form like this with a certain collection of eigenvalues, I can always, turns out, replace it with the one uh, which has this property. Um, one thing I should remark, because these operators commute, it's reasonable to, to, uh, to ask for a, um, for a function which is a simultaneous eigenform, so there are infinitely many operators. <coughs> but in fact, there's even a basis of this space uh, which consists of eigenforms. So, um, and one object which we'll use a little bit later um, in the shadow here um, is the L function. So, if I have such an S, I can attach to it a complex L function uh, and so it's a product over primes. Uh, yeah, I mean, I say this. Uh, well, just in my notes, I should, just so that when I write this in my notes, I'm going to call also the eigenvalues lambda. Okay, so with this normalization, <coughs> um, so. I can write down this uh, L function, which is a product of the prime, so it's just like <coughs> and then there are also some factors uh, for the bad primes. So we'll talk about them, but there's a similar kind of expression. 
uh, and epsilon here is a character. Uh, well, it, it's a character. In fact, who's um, yeah, who's um, <coughs> well, it's a character which which depends on the form of that. So. Okay, so uh, well, this is a kind of basic object, and uh, kind of one of the basic facts about this object is that this so S here is a complex variable, and this converges. This product converges for the real part of S is sufficiently large, depending on the weight, and then in fact it has analytic continuation. <clears throat> okay, so this is just a object. So this is kind of an object from uh, complex analysis, um, <clears throat> but now I so now I kind of want to introduce its relationship with the Galois representations, which I think is really a remarkable thing because that's not a sort of something outside the world of complex analysis. So let me just fix some notation. Um, <coughs> so I'm, I'll fix a. Um, let me fix an algebraic closure, which I can just take to be the uh, algebraic numbers in, inside the complex numbers. And <coughs> I want to look at a finite set of primes, which here will just be the set of primes dividing <coughs> n together with some prime p, which may or may not divide n. And then if I look at the Galois group of this algebraic closure, it has a quotient which corresponds to extensions which are unramified outside uh, this finite set of primes. And <coughs> in here, I have, so if B is not in the set, I have a kind of conjugacy class of special elements. Uh, so B is B is a prime, and this is characterized by the property that if I kind of let, so I have the finite field F B, and sorry, uh, yeah, so I have the finite field F B, and <coughs> I have an algebraic closure of it, which kind of comes from an algebraic by reducing this guy somehow mod B, and on this guy acts by sending x. So here you should think of V as really a prime. So it's for example 3. <coughs> so there are some special elements in here. Um, so now I can state the theorem. Theorem, which is kind of classical, so it's this due to Shimura when k is 2, Deline when k is greater or equal to 2, and Deline se when k is 1. Um, <coughs> so so F will be a non-zero eigenform. Non Sorry? Non-zero. I said non-zero, but the theorem wouldn't be interesting if it was zero. Uh, <coughs> what's, what's in the shadow there? There's here? This, just here? Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, this is just... This is just attribution, I mean. So, if you don't see what's in the shadows here, if you're one of these people, you might be offended. But you the won't, there'll be nothing missing. Sorry? On the other microbe, you have exponents in the shadows. Yeah, that's maybe not so good, but how about that? 
Uh, <coughs> so, uh, yeah, so the theorem says, first of all, that if I take these um, eigenvalues, these Hecker operators, then first of all, this is a number field. So it's a finite extension of Q. Okay, so this is already a little bit surprising because I mean, uh, <coughs> a priori, these, these, uh, these coefficients are just complex numbers. So they have, a priori, you don't have any right to expect that they're algebraic or that certainly that they uh, just generate a finite extension but if f is an eigenform <coughs> then it's true but so this is surprising but maybe only a little bit surprising I mean and so how would you prove something like this I mean underlying this is basically telling you that actually there's a kind of uh, rational version of this vector space in which the Hecker operator selects so it's surprising but the following is much, I think, much more surprising, and I'll <coughs> explain, uh, say, why afterwards. So this is a number field. Let's call this number field E sub F. And now let's take a prime lambda dividing P of this number field. Uh, so the second part of the theorem says that there exists a representation, rho F lambda, of this group here, so actually let me call this GQ sub S. Sorry, so the arrow is a little bit wet. Um, there's a continuous representation such that, uh, which is characterized by the following property. Um, if I take one of these primes, which is not an S, I look at this Frobenius uh, element and I take its trace. So I take its image under rho of lambda and I take its trace then this is just, or number, let me write it here. This is just equal to my Fourier, co Fourier coefficient, a, b. Or maybe it's better to write lambda v for the eigenvalue. Okay. Is, that, is that okay? This is kind of a, uh, <coughs> this is kind of a, uh, oops, a, uh, Sorry? Is B, P, the, the, the prime at the beginning of two? La lambda. Uh, what, and, and then P. What's the P, P running there? I mean, S was defined up here already with the prime P. But then later on, uh, lambda such as B running there. We definitely don't want. I don't understand. Oh, oh. You mean that I, I'm confused. You mean that you're talking about this lambda here, or? I mean, there's no logical, somehow in the sentence. That's not the left over, it's the left over V with P. No, v is, v is not P. That's what I think. Yeah, because V is not an S, whereas P is an S. So, <coughs> that can never happen. Uh, No, so what I want to say, this is a kind of punchline here, so I don't, didn't want this lambda v to be in the shadows. So, um. Mark, what is the subscript? I'm sorry? The subscript in the last lambda is a v. Yeah, let me put it up here, because this is really. Okay, so you have a representation of this group. Okay, so. <coughs> Okay, so you have a number field here, you take a prime, you complete it there. So you could imagine, there's no harm kind of here to imagine that this is just Q. Okay, and then this would just be QP. Okay, in general it's just a finite extension of QP. So you have a representation of this group, which is a profinite group, into GL2 of a p field. 
And it's characterized by the property that if you take one of these Frobenius elements, you apply rho of, you apply the representation, you take its trace, the trace is just given by the eigenvalue of the corresponding Hecker operator. Okay? And uh, maybe I'll also mention uh, this is an interesting representation. <coughs> I mean, it's two dimensional, but it's kind of genuinely two dimensional. So a result of Ribbert says that rho of lambda is absolutely reducible. Okay. So let me just say a word about why I think this is already <coughs> uh, an amazing theorem and why it already shows there's something really, really uh, rich and surprising going on. Um, <coughs> I mean, the kind of general remark is that uh, what this is telling you, one thing that this is telling you in a rather kind of precise way is that amongst these Fourier coefficients, there are many, many congruences, modulo primes, okay? So <coughs> kind of one way to see this is the following. So this rectangle is a picture of our group GQS. And uh, if I take just any point in here, so it's just, let me call the point G, the group element, um, <coughs> these Frobenius elements are dense in this topological group. So I can choose a sequence of points approaching, approaching this, um, my chosen element. And because this representation is continuous, <coughs> as these Frobenius, as these Frobenius elements approach this point, the, uh, the, trace, the traces have to approach the, um, the trace of G, right? So these are, this is kind of like V1, etc. So the trace of rho f lambda uh, rob Vi has to approach the trace of rho f lambda of G so this is just some piatic number, uh, and this is these are our eigenvalues. <coughs> and so, right? So what this says is that piatically these converge, in fact, to as as the elements in the group kind of converge to something in the group, the uh, the Fourier coefficients of the form converge piatically to something. And in fact. Uh, I mean, you see, P was just an arbitrary prime that I chose. So here you have piatic convergence, but I could have chosen a different prime. And then I would have had convergence, kind of P primatic convergence. Uh, so not only do these Fourier coefficients satisfy these congruences, but they actually do so kind of simultaneously for all, for all different P's. And I think this is kind of remarkable because they started off just being complex numbers, and suddenly you see that they kind of have a piatic, there's a kind of, they, that suddenly you see that they have a piatic nature. So <coughs> this is, uh, I mean, in the subject, this kind of piatic congruences is kind of a, a kind of a theme in the subject. And, uh, well, I hope we'll see this, see this again. So, okay, so this is, this is the uh, theorem. And well, when you have such a theorem, there's a question. So let me, sorry, kind of fiddling around with these boards. So <coughs> one question you could ask, which I'll come back to, I mean, I won't answer this um, straight away, is which, let me answer it completely, uh, which row of lambda arise in this way That doesn't make sense. So, which rows arise as a row f lambda? Uh, <coughs> so, if I have a finite extension of QP, I can just look at 
representations uh, from my group into GL2 of E. And I can ask, is rho equivalent to some rho of lambda? Okay. And in fact, there's a conjecture due to Fontaine and Mesa, which gives, <coughs> gives an answer to this. And we'll see, I mean, at the end, I'll explain something, some result towards this, uh, this conjecture. Um, so, but before we get to that, um, let me mention, let's, let's kind of do something uh, which is apparently easier. So, <coughs> something which is apparently easier than uh, p-adic representations is just my p representations. So, if I have my, uh, <coughs> if I have a representation like this into a p-adic, GL2 of a p-adic number field, I can look at the ring of integers. So if this was QP, this would be ZP. And <clears throat> then I can look at the residue field. So that's just a finite field. And if I conjugate my representation over here, because GQS is a compact group, I can always make it go into GL2 of O of lambda, and then, so this is rho of lambda, and then I can reduce it mod p, and I'm just going to denote the composite with uh, the bar. <coughs> so in general, this depends on the way I conjugate this representation to get it into here, but after semi-simplification, it's independent. And, <coughs> well, rho of lambda is absolutely reducible. Uh, but this reduction can be reducible. But, of course, if it's, uh, if it's, if it's absolutely reducible, then it doesn't depend also on, the, on any choices. So it's kind of well determined after semi-simplification. Um, so there was a conjecture... So I asked which row of lambda, which representations appeared as a row of lambda. So you could ask the same thing here. <coughs> and uh, the question is really interesting just for um, irreducible representation. So suppose uh, I have a finite field of characteristic P. Uh, and suppose I have continuous representation of this group into GL2 of F. So let this representation be continuous. There's one condition, which I'll explain in a second, odd and absolutely reducible. Uh, so odd just means following thing that if I take in here uh, the conjugacy class of complex conjugation, so just an element <coughs> uh, which induces complex conjugation on, uh, <coughs> well, so I mean, you have Q, our Q bar is inside C, so it's an element which is continuous for the complex topology and induces complex conjugation. then odd just means that the determinant of rho bar of C is minus 1. So it's complex conjugation, so it's an element of order 2, and I want, uh, I want one eigenvalue to be 1 and one eigenvalue to be minus 1. Okay, of course, if P is 2, then this is not a condition. Uh, and so, okay, so you, as I say, you can ask the same question sort of, the p-adic representations, uh, which mod p representations uh, appear this way. And say I conjectured that the only condition is basically this condition of being odd. So in rho is equivalent to rho lambda bar for some lambda. 
And <coughs> so this is now a theorem due to Karin van Um, <coughs> and um, so it's, I think this deserves kind of an exclamation point. Um, <coughs> So, uh, so one thing, as I'll explain something about, um, I mean, the inputs to this uh, in a second, but <coughs> I mean, this builds on the, uh, on the work of many people. And in fact, it uses practically, it uses practically everything which, is, uh, <coughs> which was known in this, this kind of subject. Um, but one thing I want to ma mention, kind of especially, I don't look well, in its use, but other things so it's contained. So there was first to resolve a kind of potential version due to Taylor. Um, <coughs> so, uh, which says that if I take my row, sorry, so this is row bar, if I take my row bar, and I restrict it to a totally real field, so I restrict it to an open subgroup. So this is a totally real field. And <coughs> in fact, I mean, so, and in fact, this kind of result, I mean, a generalization of this kind of result gets used in. It's one of the ideas in proof of, of the Sato Tate conjecture. Um, so in that situation, one doesn't have this kind of implication. I mean, the analog of this statement is not known. But at least something like this is known. <coughs> and it's enough for that application. Um, <coughs> yes, so that's one remark. Um, and. Another remark, which is important for, the, uh, for the, an application that I would explain of this, is that, um, so you see, here you might, you might already ask here, uh, if I have a row bar, so I'm telling you that uh, it arises from an f and a lambda, but the f, and, before I could even talk about an f and a lambda, I had these integers n and k, right? I had the level and the weight. So, <coughs> you might ask, what is the level of noise here? And, well, I won't describe this, but in fact, there's a uh, part of what's there conjectured was that uh, the, <coughs> the row bar arose from a row bar f lambda with a specific level and weight. So, uh, so say predicts the, uh, the level n. Um, so let me explain a kind of equally remarkable consequence of this conjecture, which was already pointed out essentially by Sarah, and then in the generality I'm going to explain it uh, <coughs> as kind of worked out by Ribbert. Um, so this is to modularity of abelian varieties of GL2 types. So suppose I have an abelian variety. A, dimension G, and let's assume that this abelian variety, that if I look at its endomorphisms, 
to the Q. So this is a <coughs> this is a finite uh, a finite Z algebra, but I tensor this by Q. So I want to assume that there's an embedding. Uh, so there's an embedding of a number field in here, where the degree of a number field is G. Okay. So the simplest example would just be the case where uh, <coughs> G was one. So then you would have an elliptic curve, and uh, <coughs> and uh, and then F would be Q, and so. Um, so the corollary is that, um, so un under the, well, under these conditions, so then A is a quotient of the Jacobian of modul of a modular curve. So, uh, well, up to kind of taking a power. So if M, so if M, if uh, A was simple, I could just take the Jacobian of a modular curve itself, um, So here, x1 of n, it's uh, well, a priori a complex curve, but it has a structure over q. And I get it by taking my group gamma 1 of n that I was working with before, taking the quotient by the upper half plane. That gives me a Riemann surface with some punctures. And then I compactify it. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and one of the important applications of this <coughs> is, is the L function of the abelian variety. So, right, remember there was an L function attached to a, <coughs> to the modular to a, to a modular eigenform, and I remarked that it had analytic continuation. So, you can do a similar thing. And the Boolean variety, and then the local factors you, uh, that I should maybe use V, call V, uh, yeah. So you can time some bad factors. Okay, so this has analytic continuation. Okay, here TLA is the elliptic tape module. So L is some auxiliary prime, which has nothing to do with, with, uh, <coughs> uh, with anything. Actually, here I guess I should may as well take L P. Um, <coughs> and the piadic tape module is just the following thing. So I take um, I take the P to the n torsion points of the abelian variety because the abelian variety is defined over Q. Say this. Well, I said it here somehow. Okay. Um, there's an action of the Galois group <coughs> on the p to the n torsion points, and then if I take the inverse limo with respect to n, I get a um, a free ZP module with an action of the group, and so this is, my, this is my guy. So again, if A was an elliptic curve, this would just be isomorphic to ZP plus ZP. It would be free ZP module of rank two, and you would have this action of this group on it. Um, <coughs> so, so for elliptic curves, this theorem was known before. Um, and uh, 
I mean, this is the kind of theorem that, that you need, for example, if you want to consider something like uh, the Bertrand and Dye conjecture. So suppose you want to solve one of the clay problems and you're a number theorist. There's not, <coughs> not so much choice, so maybe if you're not, if you're not an analytic number theorist. Um, <coughs> so, and that conjecture refers to the value of a function like this at, at a point where the, if you, where if you just take this, this, uh, this Euler product naively, I mean, it won't converge at that point. So you need analytic continuation at least, at least to that point. So uh, this is kind of a very important fact about <coughs> such abelian varieties. Um, so I want to actually give the proof of this, uh, of this corollary because I think it's so nice and it really, once you have Sayers conjecture, it just rests on the fact that, um, which I mentioned before, that the space is finite dimensional. So I think, to me, it really shows the kind of the power of a finiteness result in number theory. So, um, <coughs> uh, so here's the proof of the corollary. Um, goes like this. Um, so, <coughs> uh, <coughs> yes, goes something like this. So let's just choose some prime. Uh, lambda dividing p, and then I can look at the uh, at the tape module. Uh, so TPA and I can take uh, the part kind of there's a, there's a part of this which corresponds to the prime uh, lambda so this is a prime of that So I just take a piece of this uh, and, uh, well, actually maybe here this is, uh, maybe I should, maybe I, it's, so here I should already tends by Q. So. Anyway, so I take a part of this uh, representation and let's call this rho of lambda. <coughs> so this condition that, I mean, the, you see, the, the, the rank of this is 2G in general, and the dimension of, uh, <coughs> as, a, as a QP vector space, and the rank of F over Q is G. So this will always have, this will be two dimensional. It's a two dimensional F lambda vector space with an action of my group. Um, and then I can, then I can uh, reduce this. I mean, I can take the mod p representation, and uh, so. Uh, oh, sorry, there's no a here. There's no f here. Yeah? So it's just a lambda. And what one can check is this is an odd representation, and <coughs> also. Uh, one can check that it can't, in fact, it can't be reducible uh, <coughs> for, um, I mean, there are infinitely many primes where this representation is uh, absolutely reducible. So then Sayre tells you that, in fact, this is attached to some, uh, to some modular form. Sayre's conjecture. Okay, and what does this mean? Uh, right, so what this means is that if I take the, uh, the trace 
of Frobenius on rho a lambda, then this is just equal to my eigenvalue lambda v mod lambda. Okay, so this lambda has nothing to do with that lambda. This is just a lambda sum b. This was an eigenvalue, uh, right? This was the eigenvalue of the Hecker operator TV acting on F. <coughs> now, an F is an eigenform. Um, now, something actually I should have said is that, in fact, say it tells you the weight. And so if you take, um, uh, and the level, so if you take um, at least lambda large enough, in fact, uh, the says recipe will tell you that k is 2 and n is fixed. It depends somehow on the bad primes of bad reduction of, of a. Um, so you see, if I fix lambda, this formula here, mod lambda, uh, so the lambda v is an, is, is an eigenvalue for the Hecker operator acting on f, and f depends on the prime that I chose to, that I chose to, uh, <coughs> I mean, it, dep it depends on this choice of prime. Okay? I, mean, if I choose a prime, I get a mod p representation, and say so it tells me there's an f. <coughs> but since this space is finite dimensional, there are only finitely many choices for the set, so there must be at least one which appears infinitely often. As the space, so k was two, and n was n was fixed, so it didn't depend on any choices. As this is finite dimensional, there are only finitely many eigenforms, which we're considering here. So <coughs> one one f appears infinitely often. And so, uh, so then we can just consider that, uh, that f. And then <coughs> we have a congruence like this, but for infinitely many lambda. So actually, these two numbers must be equal. <coughs> so this tells me that actually, uh, that, uh, I mean, that this rho a lambda, in fact, arises from, uh, <coughs> which is a two-dimensional representation, that it actually arises from uh, my modular form f. And then to, uh, to write a in this way, so this is a kind of statement only about Galois representations, or is this a geometric statement? So for that one uses a theorem of Falkins to get from one to the other. Use Folting's uh, <coughs> well, Folting's proof of the Tate conjecture uh, to get the fact. Then you have a statement like this. Um, <coughs> now I, I mentioned that uh, this theorem. Uh, so this corollary, when E is an elliptic curve, <coughs> it was already known <coughs> due to the work of Wiles and Taylor Wiles and uh, several people after that. And if you kind of, I'll remind you kind of the, of the main theorem which goes into that in a moment. And if you're at all familiar with that argument, then <coughs> uh, the proof in the case of an elliptic curve kind of looks different, I mean, to this proof. Um, <coughs> but in fact, the main ingredient which goes into that proof already goes into the proof of Sayers conjecture. So let me let, remi let me remind you uh, 
what that, what that ingredient is. And here I'm kind of returning to the question which I asked, which is, um, I guess I'm not numbering my theorems, uh, the question which I asked, which, which is which piatic two-dimensional piatic representations arise as a row of lambda. So here's a theorem which kind of describes <coughs> a result in that direction. So suppose that, so this is in the shadows, but there's no content. So suppose that you have a row as before, integral to of e, e is a finite extension of QP. And <coughs> now I'm going to, so the conclusion will be, of course, that rho comes from a modular form. Uh, <coughs> but then what are the hypotheses? So the first hypothesis, which is in fact somehow the key one, which I'll try to discuss a little bit uh, later, is that rho is potentially bus <coughs> Tate. I'm just going to write BT since I'm in any case not <coughs> explaining right now what that means. Uh, and the determinant of rho should be equal to the cyclotomy character times an even character of finite order. So chi is the cyclotomic character. Uh, <coughs> so, well, one thing I want to say about this condition, uh, whatever it means, is that it actually only depends on the restriction of rho to the local Galois group at P. And <coughs> what it says is that in some sense, uh, rho, look, lo, rho, when I think about it locally at P, in a certain sense, it looks like it comes from a billion, an abelian variety with potentially good reduction at P. But uh, I want to stress that it doesn't literally imply that. But there's a certain kind of classification of these representations, uh, these local representations, and in this classification, uh, so if you kind of use Cauchy-Hodge theory to analyze rho, it exactly means that it looks like it might come from an abelian variety with good reduction. But locally, there are other obstructions to that. Um, <coughs> so, uh, <coughs> so ideally, if we were in a perfect world, I would then I would now write that uh, if it's, if rho satisfies this condition, then it arises from from an F. So rho arises from a rho of lambda, but that's still a conjecture, so since we're not in a perfect world, I have to, uh, have to add something to this. So I'm going to try to um, <coughs> So there are some technical assumptions. So if I look at row bar, so again, I get it. This is defined the same way as before. I conjugate this so it goes into GL to the ring of integers of E and I reduce mod P. Uh, there's a kind of irreducibility assumption. So this is absolutely irreducible. <coughs> and has non-solvable image. If P equals two. And then finally, uh, I want to assume, ah, I don't have, so I'll just put yeah, rho bar is modular, so at least rho bar comes from a modular form, and I don't have any room for the conclusion, uh, but I already told you what it is, uh, so I guess I don't have any choice. I'll just put it here. So then rho, rho is modular, and in fact f has weight 2. <coughs> and so 
this theorem is in fact, uh, well, this kind of theorem is what goes back to, <laughs> this is the kind of theorem that was first proved by Wiles and Taylor Wiles. And so here, <coughs> this is a kind of, uh, the, the theorem in the strength we have it today. Um, <coughs> and, well, notice, I mean, that you, you, you can immediately notice that actually, from what I've said before, this last condition isn't necessary because, uh, because you see the condition here on the determinant, I already have a condition on the determinant of rho itself, and uh, it's the cyclotomic character times an even order character, and the cyclotomic character is odd, so certainly rho bar will have odd determinant, and I'm assuming that it's, that rho bar is absolutely irreducible even on a subfield, so this is a kind of, you should think of two as some kind of irreducibility condition, and so, in fact, from what I've already said, one and two imply three, okay? So, <coughs> as a corollary, we get that, we get just the same theorem, so just one and two imply uh, <coughs> that rho is modular. But in fact, this theorem is used in the proof of of, uh, of Sayers conjecture. So this is a little bit funny because <coughs> Sayers conjecture, you're meant to be trying to prove that rho bar is modular, right? Here you have a theorem where rho bar is modular, it's kind of in the hypothesis. So you might be a little surprised that you can kind of use a theorem, but you can use a result which has in the hypothesis the theorem you're trying to prove, to prove the theorem. <coughs> so, but it works. Um, <coughs> and I should maybe mention that uh, Again, a kind of analog of this theorem in high dimension is one of the ingredients in, in the proof of the Sato-Tate uh, conjecture. Uh, so, <coughs> so this corollary, I mean, as I said, ideally you would just have that one implies uh, that rho was modular. And here there's an extra absolute irreducibility assumption. <coughs> Um, nevertheless, I think this is kind of a remarkable, so, th so this is part of the fontaine mazur conjecture that one implies that rho is modular. And <coughs> this is a kind of, I think, really surprising conjecture. So this is a kind of, uh, in some sense, surprising result because <coughs> in particular, this implies that attached to rho, which is a kind of purely piatic object, there's a complex cell function. Which has, uh, so first of all, this kind of makes sense. Um, <coughs> and it's entire. And <coughs> you see at the beginning, I started with a modular form and I kind of remarked that a priori the Fourier coefficients were just complex numbers and suddenly they had this kind of piatic life. Here we've started at the other end. We've started with, with a piatic Galois representation. And <coughs> if I wrote down kind of the, if I tried to write down the definition of this L function a priori, it wouldn't even make sense because this L function, I would try to write it as a product and in the product I would have kind of traces of Frobenius traces of Frobenius under this representation. But a priori, those traces are just piatic numbers. There's no reason to kind of expect that they're, <coughs> that they're algebraic or complex. And, I mean, and in general, without any assumption, of course, it won't be true. But now the surprising thing about this kind of result is that you make just one, so I didn't explain kind of this, what this technical condition means exactly. But whatever it means, it depends only on the restriction of rho to a decomposition group of P. Okay, so it's a kind of really piatic assumption. So you make one assumption like this, and suddenly your piatic object has a kind of complex, a complex life. Um, 
So I think this is kind of a remarkable thing. Maybe I'll stop there. Um, I mean, in the end, for example, I mean, I mean, I'm not sure what it means to kind of be a viable approach. I mean, it uses some tools. Um, <coughs> in the end, to, to prove, I mean, in the end, a theorem like this, uh, say in this generality, wasn't known before you knew Sayers conjecture. Now, one thing I point out, I mean, once you have Sayers conjecture, if you then come back to this corollary, there's another way of proving that, N namely, rather than using this kind of finiteness argument of Sayer, you could take one of these row bars, row bar A lambda, and it's modular. Yeah, okay. Yes. Um, <coughs> I mean, of course, it implies it, um, but I don't think that, I mean, certainly everything you need to prove that already, to, to prove modularity of elliptic curves, it's, it's more or less enough to, um, it's more or less enough to have a statement like this plus some tricks. But that relies on the fact that that kind of GL2 of F3 is solvable, for example. I mean, so in other words, for, for elliptic curves, the cases of Sayers conjecture that you need, you can deduce in other ways. Yeah. Just what, what part of the hypothesis in the theorem is giving you way to? Ah, it's um, well, it's kind of condition one. <coughs> so it's e I mean, it's easy to well, not easy, but if you um. Somehow it's not hard to see that if you have a row and it comes from some row of lambda, then if you have one, then you see that f has weight. If f has weight too. 